Amen. It's a humbling thing to preach on this Sunday. I will tell you, um, that it, it feels this way every year. It's the, our, our musicians and our choir, it's like they fire off this grand cannon, and now I stand up and a little BB rolls out the end of the barrel. You know? But hear this word, nonetheless. I want to read to you two passages. Uh, hear a word from the book of Acts, from the 23rd chapter. While Paul was looking intently at the council, he said, Brothers, up to this day I have lived my life with a clear conscience before God. Then the high priest Ananias ordered, him, uh, or, uh, ordered those standing near him to strike him on the mouth. At this Paul said to him, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. Are you sitting there to judge me according to the law, and yet in violation of the law you ordered me to be struck? Those standing nearby said, Do you dare insult God's high priest? And Paul said, I did not realize, brothers, that he was a high priest, for it is written, You shall not speak evil of a leader of your people. When Paul noticed that some were Sadducees and others were Pharisees, he called out to the council, Brothers, I am a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees, and I am on trial concerning the hope of the resurrection of the dead. When he said this, a dissension began between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. For the Sadducees say, there is no resurrection, nor angel, nor spirit, but the Pharisees acknowledge all three. Then a great clamor arose, and certain of the scribes of the Pharisees' group stood up and contended, we find nothing wrong with this man. What if a spirit or angel has spoken to him? When the uh, dissension became violent, the tribune, fearing that they, would be, that, that they would tear Paul to pieces, ordered the soldiers to go down, take him by force, and bring him into the barracks. That night the Lord stood near him and said, Keep up your courage, for just as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, so you also must bear witness in Rome. And from the gospel, hear this word. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. An angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. For you have found favor with God, and now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, and his name will be called the Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. I realize on Christmas Cantata Sunday that uh, a reading like the one I just gave you from Acts 23 sounded way out of place. I realize you did not come here two weeks before Christmas to hear a story about the Sadducees who uh, uh, come across in that passage uh, as the sour-faced jurors in one of Paul's many trials before a religious court. But I hope you bear with me for just a couple minutes and I'll try to explain why I bring them up today. Uh, if you know the context of the dialogue uh, that we eavesdropped on there in Acts 23, you will remember that a part of what Paul is on trial for is proclaiming a new and unusual and to what was considered by many uh, absolutely absurd doctrine, 
uh, uh, that God could bring people to life from the dead. Paul was on trial for creating disturbances in the synagogue by proclaiming something that seemed mysterious and out of anybody's realm of possibility and uh, that it was just nonsense. Uh, Paul said, I, I can't help but talk about this. It's changed my life and it's changed the whole world. What God did through the Jesus who is the Messiah, God bringing him to new life, that changes everything. It means there's new life possible for us all. If God can take Good Friday and make Easter out of it, your worst days can be redeemed for meaning and power. That's what he's brought to, to court for. I am on trial, it says there in Acts 23. Paul, I am on trial concerning the hope of the resurrection of the dead. And that's where the Sadducees chime in. Uh, uh, t for them, talk about dead people coming to life sounded like nonsense. And, and, and for them at the time, religion was all based on predictability. That's what the Sadducees' faith was all about. It was, it was a faith that says, you follow the laws, you keep kosher, you do just the right things in terms of cleanliness and right action, and you'll be rewarded. And that's all there is to religion. You just know the laws, you interpret them rightly, and you follow them. And Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, he thinks the Sadducees have made a mistake, that they've reduced religion to the point where they have pretty much squeezed all of the mystery out of God and all of the capacity that Luke believes is there for God to surprise us and that that's all taken right out of the picture. And in fact, he adds a little editorial comment. He puts it in parentheses, Luke does, in that section from Acts. He says, the Sadducees say there is no resurrection, nor angels, nor spirit. For Luke, that's the problem. Uh, their faith is so sure of itself it no longer has any place for wonder. And I bring them up just because I think they provide such a good foil. They are such a sharp contrast to the spiritual demeanor of so many people in the Christmas story. Uh, Christmas in the Gospels is full of people who still look for wonder. And they still look for the voices of angels. And they still look for the ways in which God is going to surprise them. Uh, think of, of Mary and, and Joseph. Think of Elizabeth. Think of the Christmas shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. All of whom, in stark contrast to the Sadducees who know it all and who need to see, uh, there's, no, there's nothing going to surprise us. In, in contrast to them, they see beyond the limits of their own, their own logic. Uh, th they have kept a sense of wonder and they have kept this openness to mystery which puts them in touch with God in ways that become the hallmark of this season. Uh, you know, wonder and awe and faith. That's what Christmas calls to in us. Sadducees couldn't consider that possibility and Luke says that was their problem. Sadducees say there is no resurrection, nor angels, nor spirit. How different, how different that is from the Christmas story. Think of Mary, Gabriel appears, Hail, O favored one, the Lord is with you. Do not be afraid, for you found favor with God. You will conceive and bear a son and call his name Jesus. And then that wonderful exchange that they have. For a minute, she's incredulous. How can this be, she says? What sort of greeting is this? I am still a virgin. But what's beautiful in the story and echoed in other uh, stories at Christmas. You know, she's called to believe something that's out of her experience. She's called to rise to the occasion, and, and, and lo and behold, with no guarantee about how that's going to work out for her, and when you think about it, here's this young girl, you know, low social status. It was a risk for her to, to do this, but with very little time to think it over, she says yes to this larger, mysterious voice, calling her to a deeper purpose. Here am I. Let it be according to your word. Some years ago, uh, a theologian named Sam Keen wrote a really uh, good book, and the book was entitled An Apology for Wonder. And in that book, he argues that really the experience of mystery and wonder and awe is at the heart of all true religion. And he says it's at the heart, really, of all true education as well. And that his fear is that there, there is altogether too little wonder and mystery and awe 
in, in our churches and in our schools too, for that matter. He said, both religion and education, he says these days, tend to strive to want things to be predictable and conventional and certain. And that is, uh, you know, to eliminate the possibility of, of surprise and, and novelty. But for him, he says, that's not the way the Bible portrays things. The Bible's full of novelty. It's full of surprises. And in fact, the most important stories in the Bible are uniformly stories about being surprised, people overcoming their skepticism and rising to the occasion in the face of God saying, I'm going to do something great through you that you would never think you could do. Think of Abraham and Sarah in their old age, going to be parents of a great nation, a prospect that was so preposterous to them that they laughed out loud. And then comes the angelic voice, which incidentally is the same voice that Mary heard, is anything too wonderful for the Lord? It's a recurring theme in the Bible. Off they go, you know, on a new adventure. And, and same thing with Mary and same thing with Joseph too, for that matter. You remember when Joseph finds out this news that Mary's with child, he wants to, call, his, his reason says, get out of this relationship, call this off. And, and he, the, the, the text reads, he resolved to put her away quietly. You know, I'm not going to embarrass her publicly, but I am going to, I'm going to leave her. And, and he gets a vision. Joseph, don't be afraid to take Mary for your wife, for she is with child by the Holy Spirit. And lo and behold, you know, he rises to the occasion too, uh, trusting that there is more wonder in God than his reason can fully understand. So that's my simple point today. And I think it's really in some ways uh, the point of, uh, of the musical, or at least one point, that it, a mature faith opens itself to the voice of angels, to the song of the Spirit, which can call to you when you least expect it, and like Mary and Joseph, uh, invite you to a higher calling, to say yes to wonder and mystery and awe. And I'll close my remarks with just this simple observation that um, the Sadducees, for all their sophistication, for all their wisdom, for all their logic, we don't celebrate anything about the Sadducees. They, they became a footnote in history. You know, they're just kind of lost to the to the life, religious life of the church. We celebrate now uh, those who took the opposite course. We, we listened to God's angelic message and said yes to it. No one could have predicted that that would make such a difference. That Mary would be the mother of God. No one, nobody would think like that. But God in Mystery and wonder called her. She said yes, and lo and behold, lo and behold, the world was changed. She made room in her heart for Christmas to come, and she lived in touch with the voice of mystery. Uh, so it is. This season, we're invited to do the same. Amen.